Very good. Uh, this afternoon session, as you notice, is focused uh, specifically on the years 1912 to uh, 15. Uh, the morning session was much uh, broader, including uh, two series uh, of uh, uh, very significant uh, books. Um, so, we are now going to focus on uh, this uh, critical uh, period, and the first speaker, uh, I had never met him, and it was a pleasure meeting him today, is Ryan Kinjek. He is an associate professor in the Department of National Security Affairs, the novel postgraduate in Monterey, California. Here he is the author of several works on the history of the late Ottoman Empire and uh, early Turkish Republic. Uh, I like his most recent book, the title uh, Heroin, Organized and the Making of Modern Turkey. Uh, looks uh, very interesting. Uh, heroin. Uh, he has published guess in all the major uh, journal, International Journal of Middle East uh, Studies, Iranian Studies, Past and Present, uh, and uh, uh, he has completed a biography uh, of uh, uh, Mustafa Kemal uh, after it's supposed to be published, I think, this year, just like it, 2015. And he is working on another one uh, entitled Imperial Twilight, the End of the Ottoman Empire, 1908-1922. Uh, uh, his paper uh, today is entitled Empire's End in uh, Rumeli, that is the so-called European part of the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman implications of self-state building in Macedonia, 1912-1940. Uh, as you can guess, this is the first day I've um, ever had the pleasure of meeting uh, Stephen, and uh, it has been a pleasure. And it is an even greater pleasure to be here. I am going to use none of the work. This this does work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and now I'm here. All right. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, Many of the people that you have seen to here today and uh, have heard from are people that are people who have influenced me to be here. I, I'm uh, in this line of relationship because of many of these people. So this is a real honor for me. Uh, the topic I want to talk to you about today for the untrained youth is very far away from the topic at hand, you know, understanding um, the origins and, the, and um, uh, the execution of the Armenian genocide, or have sort of studied, um, the history of the Ottoman Empire. The two have been very linked. The, you know, the, the end of the empire, Ottoman Empire in the Balkans, um, and um, the uh, execution of the Armenian genocide during the First World War. Um, what I want to do with the time that I have here is not really talk about the ins and outs of the paper that I've written, but talk about a little bit about the reasons why I wrote it. What I think we can learn from looking at the, uh, the creation of a, a Serb government over a very small portion of what had been the Ottoman Empire in, in Europe, and that is a portion of Macedonia. Um, before I do the latter, let me just start with the former. Why I wrote this paper? I wrote this paper because of a, an emerging and, in some ways, very effective strain in the in his uh, in his recent work uh, on the evolution and the origins and evolutions and the significance of nihilism. Um, what I'm, this paper is really trying to address is some a very important addition to what uh, Professor Suni calls neo denialism. Um, neo denialism accepts elements of the old elements of denialism, which is um, nothing, and if something did happen, they deserve. Um, there is another element of denialism, though, which is important, and that is the classic bait and switch of denialism. Okay, uh, and by the way, before, I understand being recorded. I'm by, I think, some kind of law. 
I'm not speaking on behalf of the U.S. government. These are not the views of the, views of the U.S. government. These are mine. Anyway, we got that out of the way. So, in any case, the bait and switch argument is this. Fine. We should, you can talk about the Armenians, but no one talks about what happened in the Balkans. Okay. In the Balkans, there was an even greater one that beset Muslims. This catastrophe was, uh, was, is provable. And this is not, again, not me talking, but, the, uh, but the, the denialist argument. This one we can prove. This one is a more serious one. Okay. Interestingly enough, there's some uh, people who, who purport that this, scholar, you know, this, this line of thinking, and also saying, well, if anything did happen during the First World War, then nothing did. We actually, it is an outgrowth of what happened in the Balkans. In other words, the Ottoman Empire essentially did what Balkan states did to Muslims. Okay? Now, rather than really sort of doing an autopsy on this line of thinking in the abstract, what I've tried to do with my work is to look at what actually did happen in, when the Ottoman Empire ended in southeastern Europe. And more importantly, look at in real time how saw and understood what was happening. Okay? Now, <clears throat> this could be a much longer talk than it's going to be. So I'm going to try to do this in some respect. The, the area that I'm going I address in my work is essentially the region of what is today the Republic of Macedonia, one of the successor states of the former Yugoslavia. Um, for those of you not very familiar with this portion of Europe, um, one, the very least, should understand that this is historically a, a highly diverse region um, in terms of faith and confession. Uh, one finds all dominant strains of the religions of the world, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, um, multiple languages in this region of, of Macedonia, at least six, as well as dialectical virgin, uh, divergences from these languages, principally Greek. Uh, Bulgarian, Macedonian, Albanian, Turkish, one could throw in Vlach, which is a deviation from Romanian, uh, as well as Romani, the, the language of, of the Roman, of gypsies. That had been a part of the Ottoman Empire since essentially the conception. Now, this is a state, this portion of the Ottoman Empire, uh, in 1912, at the cusp of the Balkan Wars, the wars uh, it is, there is upheaval. Um, there is a resurgence in paramilitarism activity, some could say terrorism, of the sort that we would find relatively relatable. Um, there are bombings of cases of government offices, and these are bombings conducted actually by Christian paramilitaries, uh, Orthodox Christian paramilitaries, organized by, you know, as a remnant of, of a group known as the Internal Macedonian Organization, the Vucheshnata Makedonska. Um, Organization. Yeah. Now, the this region had been the scene of vicious sectarian and intercommunal violence uh, beginning uh, at the end of the 19th century. Much Anatolia. Um, this is the region, however, out of which we have the Young Turk Revolution in 1908. This is the region out of which the constitutional era begins. More importantly, this is the region out of which the new governing elite of the Ottoman Empire century emerges in large measure, and that is the Young Turk Party. Okay, so this is not a re insignificant region by any stretch. However, you know, going into the summer of 1912, the empire does not appear to be on the way, nor does it look to be uh, collapsing. In fact, just the opposite. There are elections in this region. Um, despite the violence, you see evidence of intercommunal cooperation between Christians and Christians of different denominations. What brings about the end of empire in this region? War, right? Of actually a very a war that is far more destructive after the armies kind of cease to be on the battlefield than it is during the actual kinetic fighting of this war. A war that breaks out in November of 1912. Okay. Now, in the region I look at, you know, which is again which corresponds roughly to the Republic of Macedonia, this region <clears throat> falls to Serb forces. Uh, within a matter of a month of the war actually beginning, okay? And within uh, a span of uh, a month, we have the imposition of a Serb state over this region, 
Okay, serb state in terms of the things that one would associate with the state in its most fundamental forms. Government. Um, the region is subdivided into sub into cantons, into counties. You have serb officials now presiding over as as uh, mayors, as governors, as tax collectors, and so forth. This kind of government. But more important than this, we have the beginning of something like Serbianization. And this is a term that that outside observers readily apply to what is happening in this region. Okay? Um, not just the imposition of a state, but the imposition of a Serb culture <coughs> over this region. Okay? Now, this Serbianization, this process of Serbianization, um, to all of the various peoples who comprise what the Serbs, what Belgrade called, calls Old Serbia, Stata Serbia. Okay, again, this region known as predominantly the Republic of Macedonia, as well as portions of what is say the Republic of Kosovo. Now, Serbianization is applied to all, but applied somewhat unevenly, okay, depending upon the group and depending upon the circumstances. Okay? Now this is where it becomes, where we have find certain relevance to the case of Eastern Anatolia during the time of the genocide. Okay? There is no blanket form of Serbianization. Each ethnic group is handled differently, and each one handled to, um, to degrees of, with degrees of violence and suppression. Okay. You have on the one hand general orders that people have to apply, have serve last names, each, for example. So you are Stefan, Stefanovic, who would be your last name. And this would apply for all ethnic groups. Um, in some cases, there would be the restriction of, foreign, of, le of printing of material in languages other than Serb. So newspapers that are printed in Bulgarian or Greek or, uh, or Romanian, those are closed down. Yet then you begin to see differences. The differences would be, for example, that Greek um, communities are still allowed to maintain their churches, their schools are allowed to remain open. The same would go for Vlachs. These are groups that are primarily sponsored by Romania. Now, there's no sort of mystery for why this is. Serbia is an ally to both Romania and Greece during the Second Balkan Wars. It's probably not a good idea to oppress their respective groups within their, this territory that they've now claimed for themselves. The two groups that actually receive the harshest forms of treatment at the hands of this from Belgrade <clears throat> is uh, Bulgarian Orthodox Christians and Muslims. Okay? Um, Serb oppression is rather drastic towards both, although, again, with variations. Okay? Uh, I could go on sort of great length of what the nature of the, you know, this oppression is, but let me just leave you with this, you know, with this one takeaway. The suppression of these two groups, and the sort of Serbianization both of these groups uh, incur, end up leading to a stronger, seemingly more visibly um, uh, viable and dominant Serbian region. Okay, but with different means and ultimately with different results. Bulgarian Orthodox Christians are basically told you're Serbs now. Okay, and if you don't accept that then violent repercussions may come to you. Macedonian Muslims, by and large, are told they're not Serbs, but are encouraged to leave. There is a general attempt to cleanse different portions of this territory of Muslims, um, primarily rural Muslims in the countryside. Now, very interestingly enough, this is, there's, this, by and large, what you see evidence of, and I, I should perhaps mention that um, the evidence that I use for this research is both from consular records from Britain, um, from Germany, from Austria, as well as from Ottoman records as well. And what you see is mostly indirect forms of, uh, of persuasion or oppression leading people to leave their homes and flee abroad. Things like forbidding women from wearing headscarves to um, random acts of violence to things like the, be the closing of, of mosques if the Friday prayers are not offered in the name of King Peter, the monarch of Serbia. Well, you don't see much evidence of in what is the area of the Republic of Mexico, direct forms of forced migration, people being packed up and forcibly moved to the border, or threatened with violence and then forcibly moved to the border. Most of the violence is indirect. Now, again, with 
all of the groups, there are certain exceptions that are applied. Okay? The exceptions that are are rather striking when one compares them to Eastern Anatolia. For example, Muslims are recruited by the hundreds, in some cases by the thousands, to join the Serb Gendarmerie. They are done, this, is, this occurs between 1912 and 1914 in order to combat an insurgency that breaks out in the central portion of this region. Um, an insurgency, by the way, that is predominantly Bulgar made up of Bulgarian Orthodox Christians and interestingly enough, some former Ottoman Muslim officers. Okay? So Muslims are actually, unlike, let's say, during the circumstances of the Armenian genocide, Armenians are not recruited to be the enforcers of genocide or the enforcers of the deportation. In this case, Muslims are actually recruited to be a part of the state that supposedly oppresses them. And supposedly doesn't even recognize them as a constituent part of this nation. What you also see is recruitment of no dominance into positions of political importance and even given status as, as being minor officials in the Serb administration. And many of these are former Ottoman officials. And interestingly enough, these are, many of these individuals are people who will remain rather prominent in local politics into the 1920s, which is well beyond the period that I'm talking about. But it also proved the point that through this period in which this region becomes Serb, and well after the First World War, and interestingly, well into the 19, 1950s, 1960s, that was the present, Muslims remain part of the body politic of something like representative democracy, something like local politics. Okay? It's something that you typically do not see in Eastern Anatolia at any point. Now, where I also sort of try to you know, bring the story to what we're talking about today, but also talk about how Ottoman sources are, like, are trying to perceive, you know, understand this and um, narrate or interpret the, the results of Serb um, governance in this area that used to be a part of the empire. And interestingly enough, <clears throat> you know, what we do see from perspective is uh, no discussion that there is something like something akin to a genocide going on in Macedonia. Okay. This portion of Macedonia, this portion of what had been uh, Ottoman territory. Instead, what you see is the Ottoman, you know, Ottoman officials concerned about the affairs of Muslims. There is some consular attention to ongoing militancy, remnants of this old insurgency old terrorist organization, the internal organization. But one can very much see that this kind of attention is mostly played out not so much in terms of concern for former subjects, but fitting of Ottoman geostrategic interests in this region. Uh, ironically, it's one of the architects of the Armenian genocide, Bahadine Shahir, who reveals to, of all people, the ARF, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, the, the Dashnak Satun, the idea that the Ottoman government was actually seeking an independent state in this region, the promotion of an autonomous or independent Macedonian state in this very region. Okay. Now, the Ottoman documents, that, um, which are cons primarily consular records from Skopje, from the capital of this region, uh, are not somehow included within a broader panorama of how the government makes foreign policy, let alone how these events may be affecting um, the internal domestically. Which brings me to what I hear about what I just have said for the last 15 minutes. <coughs> now, in keeping with this sort of neo-denialist line that there was a genocide in the Balkans and this you know, the violence that had been undertaken in the Balkans actually had a direct impact upon Ottoman thinking in terms of the treatment of the Ottoman Empire. This is by the documentation I'm, I'm, I'm putting forward in two specific ways. Okay. Number one, uh, it's very clear that what the Serbs were trying to achieve in you know, what becomes the Republic of Macedonia, what was to them old Serbia, is very, very different than what's going on in Eastern Anatolia. In fact, the contexts are too radically different. Eastern Anatolia the empire for 500, you know, for, okay, I don't want to do the math, I'm really bad at it, uh, 400 plus years. 
the usurp territory. Okay, Serbs were actually imposing on what had been a foreign territory. Moreover, what you what you see in Serb policy is a is a rather sort of disjointed and um, not in terribly coordinated policy to actually achieve that end. There were very real attempts to try to accommodate Serbs, at least in the short term, and perhaps even incorporate them into the workings of the Serb state. And that would include Muslims, okay, which is again what the denialist argument often ignores. Okay? And one has to consider this as a basic reality. If you were to go to the former Yugoslavia today, including this portion of, uh, of what had been Serbia, you find Muslims. They still are there, okay? And in fact, they are still part of the body politic of the Republic of Macedonia. Now, one, that's a different story. On the other, but still, this is a very this is a fundamental difference. Moreover, if you were to consider what the uh, how Ottomans viewed this moment, you know, here they have a crisis in what was a land near and dear to the hearts of the ruling elite. In fact, this was the bedrock, once the bedrock of the Ottoman Empire. Um, the Ottomans are not seeing it through the sort of eyes that neo-denialists see it today. Okay? Moreover, there is no indication that what they are viewing going on in this former portion is at all relevant to what's going on in a portion of the empire that is still part of the empire that may or may not bear some resemblance but still, you know, a part of the same world. The, the, the two are disconnected. Now, I, to, I mean, I go at greater length into this in the paper. I don't want to read too much into this. Game. Big pieces of the puzzle in terms of how the government actually thinks. Um, to borrow a very Washington bureaucratic term, we don't know how the Ottoman interagency thought. Interagency being, you know, you work in government that's a common term, we don't know how the different elements of the Ottoman state talk to one another. We don't know whether the foreign ministry had any discussions of domestic policy. What we do know, though, is that the Balkans was very much disconnected what was going on at home. And so, in short, what I want to leave you with, in case you want to is the idea that what sprung out of East Anatolia, all the horror and the carnage, was, a prop, was not something imported. It was not something learned. Nor is it some, a matter of between one horror versus another, right? The two are rather separate and actually unfold in very different ways. With that, I thank you.